All right, welcome back, everyone. Today we'll be discussing the Ukraine-Russian war, and we're joined by retired three-star General Jerry Boykin. General Boykin was the Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence and a founding member of Delta Force, which is quite amazing, and we're honored to have you. Sir, welcome. Thank you very much. It's a privilege to be with you today. Fantastic. Well, so the very first thing I wanted to ask you is what is the U.S. attitude that we should have right now regarding Russia and Ukraine? First off, with Ukraine, I don't want to see another country invaded. I don't want to see innocence and collateral damage. And then on the other hand, uh, I see that the Ukrainian government seems to be this corrupt money laundering center for elites. And so what should U.S. attitude be? Should we just stick to our own business and let them sort it out or is this leading towards something worse and we need to get involved? Well, I personally think that uh, our attitude ought to be great concern for not only the uh, Ukrainian people, and, and as you've seen the latest reports, there's over 350 civilians, not military, civilians that have been killed by the Russians. And that is just unacceptable. That should be unacceptable to us as a nation. It should be unacceptable to um, those nations who believe in freedom and uh, representative government. We should be very concerned about this. The other thing, though, is we ought to be concerned about the resurgence of uh, Russia and the, uh, the aggressive posture that Russia has taken here in, in this invasion. Um, that is changing the balance of power in, on the continent of Europe. And uh, furthermore, the thing that Vladimir Putin fears the most is, is really not uh, not the Ukraine, it's democracy. And the Ukraine, even though they do have some corruption within that government, and that's a, we've known that, that's a longstanding thing. But uh, we also need to recognize that uh, they are a democracy. And uh, that's what Putin fears. And we and the West need to stand with them uh, and, and make sure that uh, we are doing all we can to help them to be victorious over the Russians, which will be a, is a very difficult thing to do. But I don't think America can stand by and, uh, and simply accept that Russia is going to start uh, invading and annexing those nations that were part of the former Soviet Union, which is uh, what their plan is. So we do not need to be on the ground. We do not need to be risking American lives in this. But America's attitude, I think, should be that we have to stop this now. Otherwise, where does it stop? Does he go from uh, Ukraine into Poland next once he's regrouped? Uh, and he's going to go into Belarus. He's already in Belarus. So I think that we need to be very concerned uh, about a variety of things, not the least of which is a humanitarian situation in, uh, in the Ukraine. Got it. I, w I really want to ask you more in just a moment regarding on um, what specific U.S. actions we could be taking and just the rest of the West in general. But, but first, I was hoping you would give us a little bit more of a situation report on what's going on on the ground right there in terms of uh, what strategic targets have been taken, what's likely next to happen. Uh, you know, what, do you know anything about body count so far? I know that's hard information to get. Uh, what's a quick sit rep? Quick sick rep is that the Russians have, uh, they were stalled uh, after the first two days. They were stalled and they had no, no major population centers under Russian control. And that's significant uh, because the uh, Ukrainians are so outgunned and outnumbered. But the Russians have been unsuccessful in taking any of the major population centers. Now, this changes by the hour and by the time this program is over, uh, we may find that they have taken uh, a, a city or two. Uh, but they've come in on uh, basically on four different routes. And uh, as a result of that, they executed a very complex operation, which would have been difficult for the United States, which has been at war, which has uh, been at war multiple times. The Russians have not really to not since 1989 when they pulled out of Afghanistan. So they're fighting. Uh, one of the things that's interesting is they're sending in reconnaissance teams into places like Kiev, and uh, they are in. They're going into that city and and as well as the other cities, 
and they're doing a reconnaissance to, to, to be able to guide the Russian forces in there. And those reconnaissance teams are getting ambushed and destroyed. And you, you see in the outskirts of Kiev, for example, uh, you see armored vehicles that have been blown up by the resistance movement there, by the uh, Ukrainian army. And uh, now there are talks going on today up on the uh, border of Ukraine and uh, and Belarus uh, because the I, I think Vladimir Putin uh, has done two things that uh, he is probably regretting now. And, and, and the first one is that he attacked Ukraine in the first place. The second one is that he did such a complex operation that his logistics could not keep up. Mm -hmm. Therefore, there are tanks and armored personnel carriers that belong to the Russians that have run out of gas and have been blown up by the Ukrainians. So I think those two things were, were miscalculations and mistakes. And I'll also tell you that uh, you're not going to uh, humble him uh, to the point of surrender with just sanctions. There's got to be a lot of other things that have to happen as well. One of which is we need to keep pumping lethal and humanitarian aid into the Ukraine so that they have a much better chance against the Russians. Got it. Do, but do they have any real chance of holding off Russia? If so, is it just a matter of like days or weeks or months? Because I know Russia has, you know, tactical nuclear you know, strike capability of like they have a ultimate fail safe. Uh, that, that means they get to win unless there's some type of outside involvement. I mean, if you were commanding Ukrainian forces all of a sudden, what are you thinking? Well, I'm thinking that what we have to do is we have to prepare to fight a, uh, a, a an urban insurgency. Uh, we've got a. You, you're not necessarily going to uh, defeat the Russians in a conventional kind of way, but we need to be sure that uh, they are ready to fight an insurgency in their urban areas. You know, the urban terrain, worst kind of fighting that you can have. I mean, just look what we did in Afghanistan and places like Fallujah. That's a, that's a meat grinder. You're going to lose a lot of people. You're going to lose a lot of equipment. Uh, and that's what I think the Ukrainians need to be doing now is setting up for that uh, that urban insurgency that will ultimately uh, cost the Russians a lot of casualties. Now, let me tell you why that's important. The Russians left Afghanistan in 1989 after 10 years there. Remember, they went in and right. on Christmas Eve of 79 and uh, they stayed there 10 years and they came out and they had accomplished nothing except they had sent home a lot of young Russian boys in body bags. And the Russian people began to ask the question, why? What are we doing? What are our objectives in this place, this primitive place of Afghanistan? Why are we there? And the pressure mounted on the leadership of Russia. And, and that was the primary reason they pulled out after 10 years. That is an important issue now because they already have uh, people out in the streets protesting against Putin in the cities in Russia. Now, the police are coming out and quickly uh, breaking up these uh, demonstrations, but it doesn't, it doesn't matter. The people in Russia are not behind Putin on this. And every time you send home a plane load of uh, young Russian boys uh, in body bags, uh, it only increases the, uh, the, 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 attitude of the people in terms of their questioning of Putin's uh, motives, the questioning of Putin's uh, sanity, his, uh, his mental state, his cognitive skills. And I think that uh, that is going to be a major factor in this. So, yeah, if, if Putin can take Ukraine they, with what he's got there now and what he could bring to the fight, he can take Ukraine. But is he willing to pay the price? And I, I think that's a question that uh, only Putin can answer. Copy. So, so far, uh, Biden's issued some really weak sanctions that doesn't even hit Russia where it hurts of like, we're not uh, cutting back on purchasing any oil from them, which is most of their economy. Uh, we've got some Hollywood celebrities. One of them just uh, wrote a poem 
to Putin about how if she was his mother. And so th these seem to be some of our more uh, aggressive, <laughs> but completely ineffectual stuff that the United States is doing. What do you think that we should be doing in response to all of this? Number one, embargo uh, any oil coming out of Russia. Yeah. Number two, restart energy independence in the United States and do it today. Right. So that we can tell the Europeans, we will supply your needs. You do not need Russian oil. We'll supply your needs. And, uh, you know, America produces more oil than the Russians anyhow, or oil and natural gas. We, we do that. Third thing is keep pumping lethal weapons into the Ukraine. The fourth thing is start uh, figuring out how you're going to permanently base additional uh, U.S. troops, NATO troops, in places like Poland uh, and the Baltic region, as well as Romania, Bulgaria. We need to have a permanent presence there. We, you know, NATO, unbelievably, NATO has kind of come together and coalesced. And now you see that they brought the Germans on board. Well, that is a significant thing. And what I think Vladimir Putin was hoping was that he was split NATO, that he had enough influence because of their dependence upon his uh, energy uh, that he could split NATO. Well, what he's done is he's unified NATO. And this is a wake-up call to NATO. And even the Germans now are saying they're going to raise their defense budget up to 2% of their GDP. Well, that's significant. And the others are going to have to do the same thing. And now I think for the first time in 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 a, in a long time. NATO is unified. NATO sees that Russia is still a threat. NATO realizes that NATO has got to create a new posture for itself. And I think that that includes stationing uh, NATO troops and uh, as a buffer uh, in the vicinity of the Russian border there to, to the east of NATO. Right. Uh, next question. Uh, how concerned are you that uh, other players around the world are going to see acts of aggression done by Putin of like, oh, it's just a free for all and the West isn't doing anything. And so, I mean, uh, Iran, North Korea, China, uh, Afghanistan, uh, I mean, man, th to me, this looks like the first domino in a chain that could lead to something World War III ish. And I don't want to be sensationalistic, but I wanted uh, to note, do you see a real path where this could just become a world war. I do. And <clears throat> I think that's our big concern is that this could evolve into a world war. Look, if Putin, if, if I don't know, only a, a clinician could tell you whether Putin is rational, whether Putin's cognitive skills are impaired or whatever. But if you just watch his behavior and you imagine uh, the pressure that he must be under right now, where he is, he is losing Russians. Uh, his plan has not gone as, uh, as it was uh, expected to. And he is uh, somewhat bogged down to the point that he's had to, to send in uh, additional reinforcements to try and take places like Kiev. So um, I think that it's entirely fe feasible that uh, he could use a tactical nuclear weapon. Uh, now, if he gets bogged down in those cities and, and has and gets desperate, his his troops can't get out of there. Uh, I think it's possible that he will, even if he doesn't use a nuclear weapon, he'll use these thermal barrack weapons. And then uh, those things are devastating. And they just uh, they just suck up the air all around. Them. They kill everything in sight. And uh, I think he could start leveling cities. I think he could become totally irrational. And what does that portend? I think it portends that uh, that's a barrier that hasn't been crossed since 1945 if he was to use a, a tactical nuke or, or uh, you know, a more strategic nuke like that. But uh, I think that that's, uh, that's a Rubicon he does not want to cross because I think that does portend world war. With me, 
uh, regarding Putin. I feel like he's just doing what he always said he wanted to do and what he was going to do. So the idea when people of the media are saying he's out of his mind, I'm like, he's certainly more in his mind than our president seems to be. Uh, but uh, another thing of I don't find him uh, likely to really care uh, about Russian lives being spent. He's one of the, you know, ex KGB, like a right. thug. I mean, I don't think this guy is weeping over dead soldiers. I think he cares about the rebirth of the USSR and pawns are lost in a battle. And so uh, I, I, I find it untenable that he is insane or anything else like this. But um, as just a war fighter, people don't really understand him. Uh, I'm a little surprised that China hasn't already launched toward Taiwan. Uh, do you think that's coming very soon? And what's the next dominoes to fall, if you could take a guess? Yeah, now, China, this is interesting with China because the uh, intelligence community does not believe or did not believe prior to this invasion. They did not believe that China would uh, go after Taiwan until uh, late next year. And, and that is, or, or actually late this year, uh, the December, maybe January timeframe, because the Communist Party in China has a, a big meeting every five years. And during that meeting, they determine who's going to be the, the president of China or whatever his title is, who's going to lead China. Right now it's President Xi. And then they determine what are the policies that are going to be accomplished in the next five years under that leader. So the intel community was uh, has been speculating that nothing will happen with regards to Taiwan until after that is over with. Mm. That said, that was before all of this stuff with Putin started. Right. And and what I think. They're concerned about now is that this would be an encouragement to Taiwan, number one, because the whole West is focused on the Ukraine. So, you know, nobody's looking back in that direction. Uh, that said, I think that uh, I'm going to make a statement here that uh, in time we may be able to validate or or disregard. But I don't think that if the Chinese use this opportunity, which I think their temptation to do so is going to be very great, this opportunity that while the Balkans is the centerpiece of, of world attention to go into Taiwan, I think that what the Chinese are going to find is that uh, they're going to be surprised that this is not going to be easy to take Taiwan. Taiwan is probably the most high technology country in the in the world and it's a, just a small island out there but they have developed a lot of technology and they have only one enemy and they have had since they were formosa they only have one enemy and that's china it's just like the ukrainians ukrainians why why do they why have they been successful against the russians because they've only had one enemy since 19 i think it's 91 when they became a sovereign state They've only had one enemy, and that was Russia, and they've had time to prepare for a Russian invasion. And I think the Taiwan is exactly the same. They have good air defense systems. They have good aircraft, uh, and uh, they are a high-tech organization. So I don't think that it will just be a matter of China launching a, a, an operation and they'll have the island very quickly without any real cost, because I think it'll be just the opposite. I think it'll take a whole lot longer. And I think that they're going to lose a lot of people and material if they do that. Very good. Uh, General, thanks so much for joining us. We're honored to have you. Learned a great deal. Lots of food for thought. All looks pretty darn grim. But we really appreciate you, uh, your 36 years of service. And uh, yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, for all you warrior poets tuning in, make sure you like, subscribe, share this video because big tech despises us. And uh, check down below. Uh, this video in for relevant links. And uh, guys, train hard, train smart, and stay free. Welcome to Unbreakable Mind. Contestants have been selected to be pushed physically, mentally, and emotionally to their last possible limit. Meet Kendra, a security consultant from Miami. I'm an owner of a nonprofit dedicated to anti-sex trafficking, and I'm a survivor. 
Meet Mario, a police officer from Detroit. The discipline that he has is something that I aim to take away from this whole thing. Karina, a human resources representative from Ohio. I want to get to a point where I no longer think in my mind, what if I can't? I want to get to the point where I just know that I can. Meet David, a school teacher from Miami. I am a proud product of the inner city of Miami-Dade County, Florida, and no stranger to what it means for trauma to ambush you. Meet Jessica, a physician's assistant from Pennsylvania. I'm not going to let the people who've hurt me continue to hurt me. I am certain I will be facing these things this week. But that's okay, I'm like, bring it.